Welcome, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. As a central component of UPF's World Summit 2022, a series of Think Tank 2022 forums are convened in advance. This session, this particular session is organized by one of UPF's projects, International Association of Academicians for Peace. This uh, was set up in 2020 in Seoul, Korea, in order to engage academics, scholars, and thinkers for peacemaking programs, widening a free space of reason and conscience. For the past two years, we have organized a dozen seminars and webinars on peace studies, especially focusing on Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula. Today, we invite experts from Europe, Eurasia, and Africa to discuss about the International Highway Project, now more widely known as Peace Road Project. This particular initiative was advocated by the UPF founder, Dr. Sam Myo Moon, back in 1981, almost more than 40 years before. Dr. Moon predicted that if this project, International Highway Project, will be implemented earnestly, it will develop an Asian community, even involving United States, Germany, eventually persuading North Korea to give up its military option and seek for a peaceful union. My name is Yoshihiro Yamazaki and I am the coordinator for this IAAP project in Europe and the Middle East. A couple of technical notices for you. This session has translations into English, French, and Russian. You can choose your preferred language by clicking the globe icon at the bottom of this screen, as shown on the screen now. Also, please write your questions to the speakers in the Q&A box, also down in the screen. It will be shown to the speakers only. The questions will be shown to the speakers. Try not to write your questions in the chat box. Today, we are very grateful to have the moderator for this session. I'd like to introduce Dr. Vladimir Petrovsky. Dr. Petrovsky is chief academic researcher at the Institute of Far Eastern Studies in the Russian Academy of Science. Dr. Petrovsky has a PhD in political science and is a full member of the Russian Academy of Military Science and a senior counselor at the Asian Economic Cooperation Foundation. He is a member of the editorial boards of the Diplomatic Service, International Journal of Asian Economics, and International Journal on World Peace, among others. He is also the author of four books and numerous articles on the theories of international regimes, multilateral security arrangements in the Asia Pacific and Euro Atlantic regions, civil military relations and security sector reform, international peacekeeping and conflict resolution, human security, and so on and so forth. So much wide spectrum. But before he, Dr. Petrovsky, begins today's moderation, I'd like to show a short video on the Peace Road project for three minutes. This video would offer an overall picture and a vision of this project. So the video will be shown now. Thank you very much. Due to ongoing conflicts and discord between nations, people, and religions, poverty, 
famine, and large-scale disasters continue to afflict various corners of today's world. However, there is no conflict or discord that cannot be resolved. If we connect severed roads and tear down walls of division, the path to harmony and common prosperity opens. Peace Road is a global race of dreams for peace seeking to connect the world, promote communication and open the path to world peace by overcoming the conflicts and discords that afflict today's world. Starting in 2013, riders breathed and raced together for six years. With each passing year, the multitudes of peace-loving citizens around the world joining the marches and races of hope aimed at world peace continues to increase. Peace Road traces its origin to the International Peace Highway and Tunnel Project presented by Rev. Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Ja Han Moon during the 10th International Conference on the Unity of the Sciences held in 1981. The vision of the International Peace Highway and Tunnel is to bring the world together by connecting distant continents, resolve conflicts and discords, and build a global community that is one family of humanity. This noble vision led to a movement for peace and to Peace Road, a road of hope leading to world peace. Parliamentarians from 70 nations gathered at the Korean National Assembly for the International Conference of the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. After discussing the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula and world peace, the conference ended with a global launching of Peace Road 2018. Parliamentarians, representing every continent, announced the start of Peace Road. During the Africa Summit held in Dakar, Senegal, leaders from throughout the world resolved to work together on a peace road that begins at the Cape of Good Hope and connects the world. Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my good friends and colleagues, uh, good morning or good afternoon again. Uh, so I suggest to start our uh, conference. Uh, and first of all, let me congratulate all of you with the Lunar New Year, which uh, came in yesterday. So it's a year of tiger. And I wish that uh, this tiger uh, could give uh, uh, each of us his strength, his energy to allow us to implement all of our wishes and desires this year. And again, I would say uh, that it's very much symbolic that we uh, convene here today to discuss uh, the International uh, Highway Project, which was originated 40 years ago. It's very much symbolic because uh, uh, our founding father proposed this concept, this idea, uh, at the Conference uh, for the Unit of Sciences. So it's for us to uh, go on to take on this initiative and to start to consider what happened during these years, uh, what uh, we can do today and what could be our plans for the future. And uh, again, this idea, uh, 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 40 years ago, many people thought that this is a kind of uh, something which is uh, visionary. Uh, connected to, first of all, to uh, values and uh, uh, values of our movements, uh, ideas of our movement. And indeed, each and every road or highway or railway, uh, each and every infrastructure connects people and contributes to peace and the friendship and understanding. But now we see that the idea of uh, huge infrastructure projects like we're going to discuss today, uh, they become more and more practical and more and more governments in the world consider very seriously uh, these, uh, these uh, proposed plans of infrastructure. And of course, again, International Highway Project is uh, 
the most ambitious and the most uh, promising among all others. And uh, if uh, to go back to the uh, speech of uh, our founding father on November 10, 1981, uh, he originally, as you remember, he originally proposed uh, the uh, big Asian highway to connect uh, three uh, significant countries of East Asia, which is China, Korea, and Japan. So uh, the very original design included China as one of the participants. So it's good for us to uh, discuss at this particular session what's going on with the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And just to try to compare what's going on, uh, uh, how Chinese are going to implement this idea, what are their plans, what is the uh, implementation path, and how it is could be related to uh, our initiative. And so I would like uh, uh, to give floor to Dr. Artur Victoria, uh, who is a Portuguese lawyer, consultant, and academic researcher. Uh, and uh, with a big number of projects which uh, he participated and uh, conducted a research. And uh, uh, Dr. Victoria uh, will look into the concept and implementation of Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative, or how Chinese call it now, Belt and Road initiative. That's the, uh, their brand name. Uh, so I give floor to Dr. R. To Victoria, please. Thank you, Professor. Okay, uh, in a short time, I will try to give you a panorama of what is going on of uh, the China projects when Belt and Road, uh, starting with uh, the world panorama. Uh, the world merchandise traffic is then either by sea or land, mainly using railways and trucks. The maritime traffic points according the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development is about 80% of the volume of international trade in goods in, is transported by sea. In the continents, the transported goods are shipped and received in harbors, and uh, after customs inspection and paying tax duties, they are distributed along the countries using railways and roads. Worldwide, there is a small density of railways. Unless in France, the United States, in Euroasia zone, the Russian Federation, in its southern region of the Black Sea, and in North America and South Africa. In the African continent, the countries we can find a reasonable distribution by railways, as pointed by the World Bank reports. China, since 2013, as the project of building a worldwide railways and maritime road, assuming that according to the Asian Asian Development Bank, Asia faces an infrastructure funding gap of an estimated 26 trillion dollars, United States first, through the this, 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 this century in the year 2030. Various regional and sub-regional initiatives aim to achieve better transport connectivity, connectivity with Asia. This action includes, among others, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, connective, Connectivity Initiative, the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, the Greater Mekong Sub-Region Pro Cooperation Program, the South Asia Re Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation Program, and the Belt and Road Initiative. In er early this century, China started searching several development countries, like my country, like Portugal, for the best technology for railways control. Namely, we have here a company called FASEC, that is a world reference, has uh, received along the years engineers from China uh, so they could learn the most modern railways traffic control systems. The same with other can big companies from France, the, the, the TALT company, and Germany, the Siemens. Uh, ventures were made to acquire technology 
and as we can say, OBOA is a Chinese priority development plan. China has an excellent internal railways now, uh, railways network of 7,900 kilometers of lines across the country, linking all of its mega city clusters, all built since uh, 20, uh, 28, uh, the, the year uh, 28 of uh, this century, half of that total in the last five years. Further, 3,700 kilometers are due to open in the coming months of uh, this year. The network will double the length again to 7,000 kilometers, 70,000 kilometers by the year 35, with the maximum speed of 350 kilometers by hour. The driverless bullet trains that we have also heard uh, is connected, connecting Beijing and Zheng Yao and the sign of IPEC and the warranty for the internal railway's future expectation. So it's a very good example what we what we can expect for the future. For our project, China has planned six railways corridors. The China-Mongolia Economic Corridor, making AeroAsia Union, the new AeroAsian land bridge linking the Pacific and the Atlantic, the China Central Asia West Economic Corridor links China and the Arabian Peninsula, China Indochina Peninsula Economic Corridor that extends from China Pearl River Delta westward along the Nanchong Guangan Expressway and the Nanning Guangzhou High Speed Railway via Nanning and Pinchingen to Hanoi and Singapore. China Pakistan Economic Corridor starts from China Kashi and ends in Pakistan's Wadha. The Bangladesh China India uh, Myanmar uh, Economic Corridor is expected to boost the integrated development of the three economic plates of the South, Southeast, and East of Asia. You can search many articles, reports, and opinions on the internet about uh, in all of this, uh, this, this, this matter, technical matter, but I would prefer to, to give my statement uh, about what I think. In my analysis, I start identifying the assumptions that China has for its OBOR, uh, or BRI, as you can call now. So OBOR has a new designation that is uh, Belt, and road initiative uh, as in these uh, aims, the trade and investment development counts caused by its infrastructure growth. So the growth of infrastructure will cause uh, a growth of uh, trade and investment. The people to people connections, as a remark, we see China as a world country with more inside tourism and with a growing rate of international tourist destinations. The policy coordination and connectivity of infrastructure and in trade and financial integration, the China Development Bank and other institutions like the Association of Southeast Asian Nation Connectivity Initiative, the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, the Great Greater Mekong Subregion Cooperation Program, the South, South East Asia Subregional Economic Cooperation Program, and the Belt and Road Initiative. The international com community started talking about the possible threat that this new Silk Road could reflect on areas like defense, financial, economical imports, and taxation, 
environmental, environment issues, policies, international relations, customs, commerce and history, the East industry, and in general, in a more specific matters like protection of borders, natural resources governance, safety of the sea, safety on transportation. China's diplomatic efforts started to be done through conference by, by China ambassadors in worldwide representations where the first words of the ambassador was peace. I see every conference of uh, the ambassadors in Europe and it's funny because they, they emphasize the word peace. But all in the beginning of the conference say, we want peace, is the, the first word they say. So China wants to achieve joint development to improve educational connectivity and set up concrete cooperation mechanisms between uh, 2017 and 2019 more than a dozen latin american countries joined over 10 caribbean nations have joined and many are still actually so, uh, asking chinese investment and nearly that's a very curious thing that nearly all nato member states in eastern and southeast eastern europe have associated with OBOR through uh, bilateral uh, agreements with china so now China is pushing a, a new Silk Road to link China to the Arctic and Antarctic, a digital Silk Road of undersea cables, data centers, and 5G telecommunication systems, a health Silk Road to promote Chinese COVID vaccines. And uh, in a very curious way, looking our the future, Dan Yang Shi, the Dean of Economics Management School of uh, Wuhan University, uh, projected his thoughts about uh, China growth. He says that in 2025, the RMB will become one of the top three major currencies. Goes further. In 2030, China will have the World Knowledgement Center, the biggest one. And furthermore, that is curious because in China, all the plans are sought with decades ahead. Uh, the gross domestic product, product, uh, product uh, will reach the 60 trillion uh, dollars. So will be the, the fourth world gross domestic product. Analyzing China, the going on project, I can say that there is prerequisites for the successful implementation of a strategy of a global economic and social cooperation. It's necessary to create a political awareness, integration, and will. It's necessary a very big cooperation in land and maritime domain, intelligence, integrated intelligence, effective maritime and uh, terrestrial assets and capabilities, operational costs, life. And uh, uh, a very reasonable cycle management. I see it as key elements for our strategy the respect for national sovereignty, a bilateral or multilateral agreements in economical and financial areas, a cooperation in every education and religions, a full integration, informing and sharing on project progress and results, environmental, environmental management, cooperation in world peace, capabilities and capacity of building, an interdependence, mutual prosperity and universal, uh, universal values. So that's my opinion. I see in a very good way 
uh, the going on of a bar and uh, in a special way all the good uh, results of the diplomatic action of China that uh, has now has its partners uh, most of the nations of the world. Well, I will conclude and I will be uh, available to any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Victoria. So uh, we have heard a very interesting presentation on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and uh, uh, as of now, this initiative is uh, about eight years old. And now we have eight years old experience of the conceptual uh, design and of implementation. And uh, 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 Dr. Victoria noted uh, that uh, this part, uh, this, this type of initiative, it's not a project, it's a whole combination of large scale project, is a very unique because it offers uh, cooperation, which means that China is not going to create a kind of integration organization and China is not going to lead everybody else and to command everybody else. And the idea is very simple. Uh, Dr. Victoria mentioned this for uh, this so-called five connectivities and uh, five key uh, elements of the uh, strategy of this initiative. And the first and the most important of which is a policy coordination. And that's very simple and very essential. So what China is going to say to all others, okay, if you like this initiative, welcome to join, but you are supposed to bring in your resources, your vision, and please try to coordinate uh, our concept, of course, China do has a, a, a their own concept of Belt and Road, but uh, uh, each and every other country uh, should try to uh, align this uh, concept with the own strategy of development and uh, uh, rely on their own resources. That's important. And again, as uh, Dr. Victoria mentioned, there are two, uh, two uh, two basic components of this uh, initiative. Uh, the first, which is called uh, uh, the Maritime Silk Road of the 21st century, and the uh, landscape uh, uh, route, which is called the, uh, how do they call it? Uh, uh, that's a combination of uh, transportation corridors, which are to cross Eurasia, Asia, uh, and uh, I assume that, uh, for example, we in Russia and other Eurasian countries are more interested in this type of uh, landscape routes. And uh, to uh, discuss it in more detail, I would invite uh, to talk uh, Professor Yulia Harlamova. Uh, she's a well-known Russian specialist in transportation policy in uh, geostrategy. Uh, she's a professor of uh, the University of Transportation and she is a member of advisory scientific board to the Russian Railways Company. So, Dr. Harlamo, Harlamo please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the chance to speak in front of you. Of course, it's very important to connect continents and to create completely new transport infrastructure that would lead uh, to the unification of the humanity that will help to unite and not to disunite. The, it was very interesting to listen to, to Dr. Victoria's uh, speech about One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, I tend to agree that China is one of the main players not only in Eurasia, uh, which they are trying to um, reach with their Silk Roads, but China is also a very big player in the world scale, to, together with the United States, uh, which represent, of course, Europe and Western world. But today I would like to talk about Russia's role. Uh, and I hope that Russia will still be important on ge geopolitical uh, stage in the future, especially con con concerning uh, transport infrastructure, including railways, 
ways and uh, sea routes. I want to also show you uh, the book uh, I wrote. It, I'm now trying to translate this book into English, and I hope I will succeed in this. This book is dedicated to the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative and about China's role and uh, also about uh, other transportational uh, strategies of other countries, especially in Eurasia. As for Russia's role uh, of uh, mastering space about in infrastructure and so on, I would like to start uh, with mentioning a very important person in political geography, uh, Semyonov Tenshansky. Uh, she is a Russian geographer and scientist. He paid a great attention uh, to the problems of creating and controlling transport routes. It was uh, long ago, um, before the One Belt, One Road initiative, he actually predicted, it was 200 years ago, he uh, predicted a uh, model of transport organization uh, and, it's, and he called it transcontinental or intercontinental uh, model. And uh, he believes that uh, Russia will control mainland routes, uh, landscape routes, that he saw that Russia would pioneer uh, land inland routes. Uh, he was thinking about uh, Russia's role in terms of Eurasia and also about world uh, role. But, and he, he also named US, USA as a country that would control and master water routes. Actually, his predictions were right, at least for the 20th century. And I, I think uh, his theory will also be relevant in 21st century. One of the first uh, reasons for the First World War was, was um, a new infrastructure, new world logistics. So let's speak about modern world that we live in. And our world is not so geopolitical, it's more geoeconomical. And when this shift occurred from geopolitics to geoeconomy, then the new players appeared. So we have to pay more attention to the reality that our world is not uh, only political, it's also economical world. And this paradigm of geopolicy, politics, um, <clears throat> um, rule the situation. Russia in Russia, of course, plays a great role in Eurasia, and in that sense, it's a key player because Russia controls uh, main area, main space of Eurasia. And I think not everybody happy about it, but still we have to uh, see the reality as it is. So we can say that Russia is a natural bridge between uh, Europe and Asia. It's a natural inland bridge. And of course, Asia is now playing more important roles than it used to, to do. Uh, <clears throat> used to be, and uh, so the routes and cooperation and communication within Europe and Asia is very important, so uh, you cannot uh, view these issues without Russia. You should also see 
Russia as a stabilizer of a world space um, because Russia can influence in that sense not only Eurasia but other continents including Africa. Russia uh, geographically uh, occupies in the space of Central Asia. You can call Russia is a central region. In, in that sense, Russia can help to stabilize the world because Russia in that sense is a balance holder between uh, Europe and Asia, between East and West. And Russia, when Russia became a strong and influential power in Europe and Asia in the world in the past, then the regional and global situation stabilized and became more peaceful. I think it's, this uh, idea still uh, holds the importance. Uh, Eurasian continent is uh, the earthly permanent of the world, you may say. It's a retreat of everything real and secured. It's, a, it's not virtual economy, uh, which is uh, characterization of the uh, Atlantic civilization. So the Atlantic uh, ideas is about virtual economy, virtual reality. And it's uh, not, it can, it can be very controversial and many countries will not reside to that idea and this view of the world. In that sense, we can see Russia as a transit territory uh, because uh, Russia can be a stage for different infrastructure programs, projects, uh, political and economical belts because Russia is on the crossroads of transport routes corridors, nets, and so on and so on. It's a geographical position of Russia. I think that any uh, involvement uh, with, um, into this outer cooperation and communication will help regions to develop uh, economically, politically, and <clears throat> uh, socially. Uh, when I say that uh, regions should be open, it uh, means that they should be open tra in transport ways, wise. Uh, and, and this um, transport accessibility is always a benefit for everyone. Um, we may say that uh, if you have space, it requires communications, but communications enriches uh, the space, it helps to develop the spaces and areas. It's not only uh, natural resources, but it's actually it's planets in cultural, social and uh, other ways. So it's interconnected. And uh, Russia is a bridge, as I already said, and uh, this is a classes and assets of Russia, because transit territories, they always try to uh, mitigate the impact of negative political and economical processes. They try to negotiate and to bring closer the far ends. And I think that intercontinental routes uh, should be implemented now and we should have more open uh, ideas because that, uh, if you have intercontinental roads and routes it will lessen the economic um, <clears throat> expenses and it will help uh, to develop these regions and other regions as well so I think that Russia should pay really close attention to these ideas and to really be involved into the uh, 
international infrastructure, especially into inland roads and routes, um, and to, to be uh, very active in that sense, to be aware that now the world is different, it's uh, more ge geoeconomic than geopolitical, and try to invest its efforts and create a, the best model for uh, geoeconomic behavior and to really invest itself into the transport complex. I think Russia will play a role, important role in terms of uh, the international highway project and uh, I hope that this idea that we are discussing now should be open to Russian uh, scientific and academic uh, community and I hope that we as a scientist can present suggestions and projects that would be useful for the, this project and initiative. I'm very happy and to I will be very happy to answer all your questions that you might have. Thank you so much. A kind of a geostrategic vision of uh, how all this international infrastructure transportation projects are being viewed in Russia and in Eurasia. And it's important because it's uh, really the heartland of the world. And of course, Russia sees itself uh, as a kind of connector between Asia and Europe and other continents. And to this extent, I think we should consider uh, uh, such an important uh, part of the International Highway Project as the Bering Strait Tunnel Bridge, Undersea Tunnel Bridge project, which was proposed uh, also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the year 2005 or even earlier. And uh, the idea is to try to connect two big continents. And the idea, as you know, was discussed uh, uh, for several decades uh, and uh, there were several uh, uh, brainstormings and expeditions. But now I think we should uh, come back to this idea of, uh, is it possible, is it feasible for us to join, for I mean, for Russia to join this initiative? Again, and we come back to the, again to the, uh, the experience of our Chinese friends who propose policy coordination. What we need in Russia, I think, is to try uh, to review all uh, projects of international transportation corridors, which could involve Russia, and uh, to try to put them into the Russian development strategy. What do we need in Russia? What kind of projects uh, were supposed to join? Uh, this, uh, just to name this Bering Strait uh, project, then we have, again, going back to Belt and Road Initiative, we have Silk Road Economic Belt, which is the lands, uh, landscape, uh, uh, which is land component of the Belt and Road Initiative. And again, it's for Russia to decide what Russia wants to take from this project, how Russia could join it. And uh, 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 please not forget about uh, sea routes, such uh, as, for example, Northern Sea Route, which uh, draw attention recently because, you know, the Arctic ice is melting and the Northern Sea Route be uh, becomes more and more accessible uh, uh, through the year. And uh, many, uh, many countries uh, would like uh, to, you know, to transport their goods, first of all, China and some other East Asian countries and Korea and Japan. They keep in mind of how to transport their goods uh, from uh, Asia to Europe, for example, using uh, this Northern Sea Route. And what should be done to this extent? And uh, again, what, uh, what uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Harlamba and uh, uh, the conclusion of our speaker was to just to go uh, into detail and try to put it, uh, uh, to write it, uh, I mean, to consider it in terms of the strategy, geoeconomic strategy of Russia, what to choose, how to join. And uh, uh, I think that at least several comp components of, uh, of uh, the International Highway uh, Initiative uh, could be interested. And uh, please keep in mind that originally there were two, there were two uh, components, uh, undersea tunnel, which uh, connected uh, Japan and Korea and Bering Strait project. But there are uh, now there are many, many others. 
and uh, many many countries and many other con uh, continents are very much interested in these international uh, transportation corridors. And uh, now let me give floor to uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mamadou Kone, who is honorary consul of Mali uh, in Austria, Vienna, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> He's a linguist and uh, translator and lecturer and a well-known specialist in cultural di diplomacy and well-known participants to many UN conferences in Vienna. Uh, so please, uh, uh, Dr. Kona, uh, uh, what, what, what about African experience and what about African needs in uh, international transportation corridors, please? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. First of all, it's a pleasure to be among you today to be able to give uh, our perspective regarding this uh, very important topic, which is uh, bringing uh, the world together. And I will start to say uh, my gratitude to UPC in the uh, uh, Austria here and the uh, Women Federation for World Peace, uh, whose uh, president are respectively uh, Peter Haida and uh, uh, Renate Amsbauer. Uh, in speaking about uh, uh, Peace Road Project, it comes in my mind that uh, people live better peacefully uh, when their need is taken into consideration, when their aspiration is taken in consideration. This can be uh, economic consideration, it can be also political and social. And uh, I, I was uh, very happy to, uh, to, to hear, to hear a, an expression for Dr. Arthur Victoria, who says, uh, respect for national sovereignty uh, in regarding uh, having contact with countries. So the main role of governments is to think of the need of the population in order to provide sustainable solutions. This should also be the road map, I think, for international cooperation. So uh, now if we take an example of a country like Mali, we know what we need. So our partner in, all over the world should take into consideration what is uh, appropriate for our need. And when I say our need, it's referred to the need of the local population. So these near are various and may, be, may differ from one continent to another, and they can even be different within the same continent. So when I talk today, I'm not speaking for the whole Africa because Africa is uh, uh, 54 countries. Maybe there can, there can be some common ground between Mali and Senegal or Mali and Burkina Faso and so on and so forth. So as far as Africa is concerned, there are some fundamental basic needs that are common to all the countries. These needs are in the field of health infrastructures, and equipment, and this need are in the field of agriculture or investment in agro-industries or in educational field, and also in the branch of transform, transportation, which my previous colleague have mentioned now. But now imagine a country in like Mali, uh, building a thousand kilometers of road where people do not have access to hospitals in their place. Imagine a country like Mali building underground stations, which is a, a, a great economic proof, but where children cannot have school infrastructures. I think this is facing the wrong problem when we have thousands of kilometers and uh, access to the basic need, the basic human right, which is health and education are missing in those area. But at the same time, big companies, well, feel free, feel happy 
to have this kind of project. Now, in the end, what would we see? We will see that the roads are not practical, they are not used, but at the same time, there is a growing instability. I repeat again, growing instability within the countries. So now, the requirement, all these requirements, which I mentioned previously in the health sector, in educational sector, in agro-industry also, are indispensable for the well-being of the people. And if politics mean to take into consideration the needs of people to bring social order, I think we should be intelligent enough to face those problems. Or I would say we should have more political courage to face those problems. They are the basic human right and should be at the heart of the programs of the government. And also uh, it's up to the government to, to talk to the partners, to understand this and not to think of what international monetary fund impose to people. We want peace all over the world. So the local people, the ordinary people are much more concerned about this peace road. Now, uh, putting the needs of the local population in the center of cooperation is a strategy of reinforcement of economic, social, political stability in Africa. I would say mainly in Mali. It strengthens social order and the principle of good governance. If people see the government are taking into consideration our needs, this is the sign of a functioning democracy because democracy is thinking of the people which have those people that have elected a government. Now today, uh, in a short presentation, I will illustrate this uh, with uh, some pictures, but mainly uh, that we should think basically of these needs. So with your permission, I will start the presentation now. So when I was asked to, uh, to give a speech during this, I just decided to take uh, facing urgent needs of locals with adequate infrastructure in Africa, mainly Mali. So uh, now the content will be uh, on sustainable cooperation, which I gave right now in this introduction but also on responding to local needs in six areas, but I will not go into detail because of the time or in this, all this area, but I call them for quality cooperation. Quality cooperation, meaning the need of people. If we have the diagnosis of or the problem, uh, we can face with a solution. So this could be supporting the well-being of locals or uh, I will demonstrate that developing the field of agriculture and agro-industry and infrastructure in technical cooperation. Transportation has been mentioned, which is important, uh, but priority should be given to the needs. If I were asked to give priorities, uh, I would not put transportation in the first line. So the infrastructure also in the field of education and a short conclusion. So now, if you look at a case in Mali, uh, people are dying uh, in a very, with very uh, treatable, curable diseases because of the lack of uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have doctors who have gone to Europe to study, to America, to uh, even China, 
on Russia to study. But when they come back, uh, what they need to take care of people is missing. But at the same time, there would be big projects about uh, construction of uh, a long road. So I think uh, we should be uh, very pragmatic to, 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 to look at uh, what we could do to support the well being of local people. This is, on one hand, construction of hospitals, and at the same time, uh, uh, trying to give uh, adequate equipment to these uh, structures or these infrastructures. Developing country like Mali, we are six times bigger than Austria. So we have more space for agriculture. More than 80% of the population are involved in agriculture, but with very rudimentary means. A farmer in Mali cannot feel a larger people, number of people. So the production is done to feed the family, the family itself. So why? Because they do not have the means for more production. So the best policy for me, and which we think could help people to stabilize in their area, to be economically productive within their own region and own country is to provide in terms of cooperation, modern tools of production in agriculture. And also uh, infrastructure in technical cooperation. For example, let's think of coal chain in agro-industry. This is a process of introducing temperature control storage and transportation facilities to prevent rotting of easily perishable food produce. Without the appropriate technical knowledge, farmers, for example, in Mali are unable to store food in a manner which keeps it fresh long enough to be exported in the sub-region. So temperature control storage helps to save the production. In Mali, uh, for example, I'll take a, an area which is called Kati. Kati is just uh, 20 kilometers from Bamako, the capital city. They produce a lot of tomatoes. It is used locally, but the amount of tomato which is thrown away is four times, even five times more than what they consume because they don't have a uh, uh, development in agro-industry and how to, uh, uh, to store this uh, production. Now, if you look at uh, this example uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India, where they have uh, uh, a very uh, important uh, storage, this is just one example to reduce food loss and helping to achieve the S DG's goals. So such collaboration in terms of infrastructure uh, could help the local people uh, and to better their life. And who speak about better life, stability, speak about peace in that region. Many conflicts in uh, Africa, instability in Africa, is linked, uh, of course, to political instability. But what is behind this, uh, this is the principle that we have not respect. If I say we, we are all involved in it. This is to face the real need of the population. Now, and also, so my presentation is frozen. Yeah. And if you think of also advanced in cold chain transportation, at the link at the left side of your screen, this is a, a, a way how uh, meat is transported in Bamako, in the capital city, in 21st century. Whereas in the right side, you can see a modern, safe and healthy way to transport food. Now, uh, if 
there is a discussion. There should be if not a discussion uh, about improving this because improving this way of transportation is to improve the quality of life of people, the well-being of people, and it's less cost in terms of uh, 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 medical treatment. And also, so uh, developing the chain coal in the agro food sector in sub Sahara is a key policy and should be also presented to the world, to the partner all over the world, Asia, America, Europe, and Latin America. So this is a process where in which people can have a, a better life. I would repeat that uh, several times. So now at your left side, Mali is in Africa, the first producer of mango, quality mango, the best in West Africa even. But the amount of mango throw away is huge because of the lack this lack of infrastructure, this uh, infrastructure for transformation, local transformation, sub-regional use of the mango. So we have a larger exportation to Europe, uh, which is uh, sold in supermarket in Europe. Uh, uh, but still we produce it and still there is no, uh, sustainable cooperation so that Mali can take advantages of uh, this product locally. Now, solving the adequate infrastructure in transportation is also an issue. My colleagues have spoken about this and I totally agree with them, but only if we have to put the needs in terms of a priority, uh, I would not uh, uh, suggest as consultant in international relation, any government to invest billions of CFA uh, in transportation or in, in building road, whereas people in common villages, in common places do not have uh, access to health center. And when I say hospital, it's not huge hospital, it could be clinic close to people, uh, women, uh, and children, pregnant women can have birth uh, in a safe way. So transportation is a good politics, of course, I do agree, but uh, should not be in the first line. Uh, this is my own uh, uh, opinion. Now, education is also something which is uh, really important. If you travel around the world, Asia, uh, in China, in uh, Russia, in uh, Europe, in Austria here, where I've been living over two decades, uh, you are impressed about the quality of studies at the university. Uh, anything you need to read, uh, you go to the library, you find it, you can finish your uh, doctor, doctor uh, PhD studies, master st studies, uh, you have access to what you need. Uh, apart from some countries in uh, Africa, South Africa, and uh, in the North of Africa, Sub Sahara Africa is lacking uh, these infrastructures, which are also in the 21st century, very, very important for the stability, for knowledge transfer also, which people need. So, uh, coming to the conclusion, uh, any effective cooperation should be based on the need of the target population. This is what has been done in Europe, in uh, America, in uh, Asia, part of Asia. And the urgent need in Africa, particularly in Mali, are uh, in the field of health infrastructure and equipment and training also in cooperation in establishing modern and sustainable agricultural facility and in agro-industry. In transportation, as I say, 
and in the field of education and communication, which I didn't uh, uh, put here uh, because of uh, the time I'm, I'm, I'm given. So uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is an overall view of uh, what I was uh, planning, what I aim to give as contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kona. And uh, one of the most important conclusions, uh, at least for me, is that we need to consider all of our transportation infrastructure projects in a broader context of human security, human development, and needs of local population. This is very much important because, after all, uh, we need this type of uh, transportation corridors exactly to improve human development and human security and uh, make uh, the life of people better. That's important. And uh, it, it, for me, it's one of the most uh, important conclusions uh, for our session uh, in general, because uh, we need to consider all these uh, initiatives, which we uh, combined, we call them international highway project. We need to consider them in really in a broader context. And uh, as I see on the screen, uh, there are, uh, now, now it's time, uh, and now it's time for us uh, for questions and answers. And I suggest uh, to uh, ask questions to our speakers and please uh, use the chat board or we see this raise your hand option on your screen. Uh, please questions and answers. We still have several minutes for this. Dr. Petrovsky, uh, I have a technical problem and I cannot access to the, to the bubble of the questions and answers. Uh, or maybe some, or maybe some brief comments, uh, some ideas from what we have heard during this session, please. Yeah. Um, I think that everything was very well said. Uh, I would say that my colleagues uh, have uh, perspectives that I completely agree. And uh, there is much work to be done. Each nation has its specific uh, necessities. Uh, I agree with uh, with uh, the, the high uh, the high hon honorary consul of Mali. I know well Africa, and I know the African reality. And uh, it's necessary to have considerations of uh, not only the sovereignty, but also uh, the, the the role that the country can uh, have in this big project that is now a reality. And uh, I, I would like also to make a special remark about in, about Africa and also in Europe, that uh, the One Belt and Road project, uh, China is not paying the infrastructure structures. <laughs> it's a, the, the, the own country where the railway or the, the roads uh, go by, they have to pay them. So it's not uh, a gift from China. China can help, China gives the technology, China can even borrow money, but it's necessary for having sustainability, it's necessary to, to, to look in the future and to see that uh, all this money, when they will be paid. Huh? And uh, in Africa, I, I, I know several situations where this was never sought before. The people think that they receive but they don't think that they have to pay after. Uh, so that comes the question of sovereignty and uh, the questions of uh, the, the, the inter, in, in interconnection of uh, the different fields like uh, uh, health that is very important, the, the, the production, but also uh, the, the question of uh, the responsibility. The politicians have to be responsible for their actions. So if they have commitments uh, that involves uh, future payments that the nation will be responsible, it's necessary to, to have that in consideration. Yes, I appreciate very much all this uh, and I congratulate my colleagues and uh, to you, Dr. Pretofsky, is I admire your work, I know well your work and uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak with you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Victoria. Uh, please, colleagues, uh, some other questions, brief remarks, limited to one minute, please. Maybe some ideas, proposals. 
Well, if we do not uh, have any so far, so let me offer you some of my concluding remarks. Uh, I think we have had very interesting and uh, uh, very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, it was a, a very timely discussion because after all, uh, we have 40 years uh, of this initiative of International Highway uh, uh, project. So what do, do we need uh, to do now? So uh, we mentioned the necessity to bring this, uh, you know, to bring uh, this concept, this idea into a broader context. And what do we, uh, so what are the ways uh, and means to do it? And I also have seen uh, some very uh, interesting question on, on the uh, chat board relative to environment, environment, uh, uh, ecology. And this is important because all these large scale uh, transportation projects, which we discuss, they all should be considered in terms of how they are related to the uh, sustainable development and to uh, environment. For example, even if to take this project of Bering Strait undersea tunnel bridge, uh, it's very much important to consider ecology because after all, this is the Arctic region. And you know that the Arctic ecological system is very much fragile, it's permafrost. Uh, and if to start considering seriously and in practical details how to uh, launch this project, we need to make a kind of environmental assessment. And again, so uh, uh, I propose as a, uh, as a conclusion to our session uh, uh, that we need to go further with this uh, 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 initiative. Uh, and uh, I mean, International Highway Project. We have already several components as part of it. But uh, what I suggest to do, uh, I suggest to, uh, okay, now we have a kind of, uh, a kind of a discussion and a dialogue uh, platform. We have it already. But I suggest to move from uh, discussions uh, to some specific uh, uh, work. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe some kind of research is needed now. Uh, what I suggest to do, maybe it's, uh, time has come uh, to establish a kind of interdisciplinary small research team representing experts from our countries interested in this project uh, to uh, conduct a kind of uh, small research, not big one, but I think that at least several topics uh, should be considered in this type of research paper, which could be like a small brochure. First of all, I think we need to go back to the spiritual and moral foundation of this initiative. Consider it again, as it was proposed 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. Then, of course, we need to review the past project developments. What has been done so far? Then uh, we need, I think, uh, to uh, consider the current context of the like-minded like large-scale international infrastructure project. As we mentioned, Belt and Road initiatives, some others and others. So uh, how uh, our international highway project uh, could be placed inside this? And are these projects related to each other? And if yes, in a what way? Then I, th uh, I think that we need uh, to offer a kind of country-based economic rationale uh, to join this project. As we mentioned, at least in Russia, we need to uh, put the consideration for this project in terms of the Russian development strategy. The same for all other countries interested. So we need a detailed and specific country-based economic rationale. And of course, uh, as a result, we could uh, uh, propose a possible configuration of the project stakeholders, because uh, it's important to involve uh, other stakeholders in this uh, project which could be international financial institutions, which could be regional cooperation bodies, or maybe some uh, special United Nations programs like UNCTAD or maybe some others related to transportation. And of course, we need to involve more and more academic community, uh, NGOs and any other uh, stakeholders. And the final goal could be, as I see it, uh, the establishment of the special uh, International Highway Project Foundation. 
uh, you know, to, uh, to, to raise, to, to, after all, to raise uh, money for this project. These are some of my uh, brief uh, proposals, and I think, to, uh, and I suggest to go on with them specific work. So, uh, please, if you are inter interested, let us know, and I suggest to conduct this small research and then to publicize the results and then discuss it again. And that could be the first useful step in uh, going further to finally implement uh, this project. Thank you very much. And uh, if no uh, other questions, uh, please give me floor to Dr. Yamazaki to make some final and important announcements. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Petrovsky, for your excellent professional moderation of this session. But particularly, I am really grateful for your final words, the concluding remarks about practical steps. I really would like to follow your advice as an IAAP coordinator for the, for the coming year so that after one year, we can have a global convention involving all the parties concerned. Indeed, currently we have various global initiatives to facilitate global infrastructure developments, such as the China's OBR, the G7's better, Build Better back, uh, World 3BW initiative, as well as the European Union's gateway, global gateway plan. But as Victor, Victoria mentioned, they are supposed to be collaborated, not conflicting at all. Perhaps the UPS guiding value principles of interdependence, co-prosperity and universal value could offer ideological compass in coordinating these diverse and sometimes conflicting development initiatives for the unified world in peace. We shall never repeat a sort of a tug of war with financial aid to developing countries as we observed during the Cold War era. In fact, as I have been listening to today's session, I was reminded of Dr. Moon's vision, vision in 1981, when he was almost sure that the communists, the regime, communist uh, do domination or the Cold War will end soon. And he gave this idea of international highway project. Suppose, the global academics took this initiative seriously and discussed in the 1980s, probably the period after the Cold War could have been different. We could have discussed with each other beyond the past enmities, hostilities, antagonism, simply to create a new world order on earth. So, even belatedly, let us begin this process as uh, Dr. Petrovsky really rightly suggested. I would like to really invite all of you who have been here, more than 300 people listening in this uh, Zoom. We are truly gratified by your presence today. Thank you very much for your patience and attendance. In the meantime, for your information, the next program of this Think Tank 2022 series will take place in 30 minutes time. It will be jointed, jointly hosted by the International Association of First Ladies for Peace and Korea's UP, UPS, as well as Women's Federation for World Peace, Europe and the Middle East. Its title will be Co-Creating Spaces for Peace and Reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. What steps are women taking towards sustainable peace? So once again, 
for the audience, thank you very much for your participation in this uh, webinar and for the panelists and uh, staff, uh, please uh, show yourself up so that we could have the final commemorative photo all together for this session. Thank you very much.